two and, and uh, lab three, and grounding and shielding and noise sources that you might run into on humans or other recording. Were there any questions about that? Uh, I, I want to make sure that people understand that reducing noise from recording on a person, particularly reducing pickup noise from 60 hertz, is also going to make them safer in general because it means that there's less leakage current across the person. So there's no, there's no incompatibility between safety and recording and noise reduction. In fact, they have some aspects in common. But there, again, any questions? Yes? Somewhat related. So if you have a transceiver, let's say a 2.4 gigahertz transceiver, and that is on a separate circuit, but that circuit is also taking some measurements from your body. So does that frequency somehow go through your body as well? So if you, so the question is, if you, if you have some sort of RF device attached to you, like a 2.4 gigahertz transceiver, do you get any of the energy into your body? And the answer is yes, generally you do, but also generally it doesn't matter because as you probably know, there's a, the higher you go in frequency, the more the inductance, the self-inductance of the conductor matters, and so the more the energy stays on the skin, so-called skin effect. And at 2.4 gigahertz, almost all of the energy stays on the skin. And so you don't get much internal, internal uh, transmission. That being said, if you put enough power into your body at 2.5 two gigahertz, you'll get burns on your skin. It's not a good idea, but at, a, at the typical output power of, a, of an instrumentation transceiver, which would be around a milliwatt, you're not going to not going to be a problem. Um, I uh, connected myself to a 400 watt transmitter once uh, to the point where I was arcing. This was really stupid, folks. I touched the output terminal of a 400 watt transmitter running at uh, 100,000 volts or so. And uh, I got a few burns on the soles of my feet because I was standing on, uh, barefoot on concrete. Durr. And uh, it felt horrible. It felt like my skin was going to fall off, but it didn't actually do any damage to me, except on the skin where I got some, some burns on my hand and my feet. I was old enough to know better, too. I was 17 or 18. I didn't tell my parents until last year. You remember that time I just came in quietly and went directly to bed in the middle of the afternoon? Well, this is why. <laughs> It felt really bad, but all the energy was two megahertz, and all the energy was on my skin. And lastly, just to reconfirm from last lecture, that if you have a battery powered device, you do not need to worry about the ground. If you have a battery powered device that is completely isolated from the mains, from the 110 volt line, then you may you can be grounded to that battery powered device, and you are completely safe as long as the battery is low enough voltage. 3.7 volts is generally considered safe. I would say anything below 24 volts would be safe as long as you're outside the skin. This doesn't count if you're sticking electrodes into your muscles or, or, or running a catheter, but you better not do that in this lab. So it's, it's quite safe, and you can, you can run some calculations on that. But certainly three volts, nobody's, you know, nobody's going to worry about that. Any other questions about general setup? So I want to talk more about now the circuitry of lab two, three, three. Um, <clears throat> then I want to talk about, after talking about lab three, I want to give you all the choice. I want to make a branch point in this in the lab of saying that we can do the lab four that I did four years ago in this class, which is the last time I taught it, or we can do one of two or three other things. I'm going to give you a choice. We could talk about that, but let's go to do circuitry for lab three first.
So in the overall, the, the recording for the, the recording setup for the EMG is going to be a diff amp, which we've already analyzed, probably some sort of filter. Then we're going to, I'm going to draw some structure that looks like this, which is supposed to represent a way of communicating across an isolation barrier that does not require electric current. So this, in the case of this connection, it's going to be optical. We're going to come off the other side. There may be another filter to get rid of artifacts from the, <coughs> from the coupling process. Then run it into the NIDAC and hence to the computer. This side of the circuit is going to be powered by an isolated power supply. So there's going to be an, a, a power supply which has grounded input 5 volts and ground. And on the other side of the, ver on the barrier produces 0, plus 12, and minus 12. And I'm specifically saying this is zero. It is not ground. All right? There is no electrical connection between this side and this side. So you're going to apply plus five from, from the prototype board or from the, or from the bench power supply. Magic happens, and plus minus 12 comes out on the other side. Actually, let's draw that out in a little more detail in just a minute. <clears throat> we need to talk a little bit more about filters. We don't need to talk about diff amps anymore. We need to talk a little bit about the power supply and a little bit about this linear isolator. But first, let me say that before you connect this to yourself, before you connect this to yourself, you need to put an ohmmeter across here, and it should read infinity. So you t pick zero volts on this side and ground on this side. Put an ohmmeter between them. There should be no connection. Then you can connect it to yourself. This gets tricky. If you connect an oscilloscope to this side, it's grounded. That's not acceptable. That means that when you're testing this, when you're trying to get the circuit right in the first place before you hook it to yourself, you're going to have to use a non-biological test circuit, which makes sense to do anyway, probably something that looks like this. And in this case, you may as well ground it because you're going to be hooking an oscilloscope to it. And this might be uh, a sine wave generator at uh, 100 hertz and uh, point, 0 0.1 volt amplitude or so, 100 hertz. And these resistors might be 100K, 1K, and 100K. So you'd expect that the voltage across here should be something like 1 one hundredth of 0.1 volt or about a millivolt. Once you get this running, then you would disconnect this piece, check the resistance, then connect it to your arm. So what is this magic power supply that uh, does this? And it turns out, now if we turn this around, say we're going to put in plus 5 here, ground. What's in here is an oscillator that runs at about 400 kilohertz. So that's kind of low RF frequency, 400 kilohertz. And then there's a little coil. And then a split coil 
on the other side that couples the RF energy out through a pair of diodes and some smoothing capacitors which you'll have to add to produce the plus 12, 0 and minus 12. Now the cool thing is that this whole coil oscillator thing is in a standard 14 pin p-dip. It looks just like any other 14 pin p-dip that you've seen except that it's missing some pins. So if we draw this, pin 1 is plus 5, pin 2 is ground. Pins 3 and 4 are non-existent. 5, 6, and 7 are 0, 12, and minus 12. And this pin is called sync. It is a gate. You put a switch on it to ground. If the switch is open, if the switch is open, then the, os then the oscillator is running. If the switch is closed, it is turned off. It is not a logic level. It is either open or it is ground. It is not 1 and 0, it is open and 0. And the reason I make a point of that is that if you raise this to plus 5, this thing blows up. And since they cost $12 each, you only get to do that once, and then you buy your own. Don't mess up. The other reason I mention that with some force is, uh, I talked to, a, I can't remember what team it was, say, I, this, this, this integrated circuit just doesn't work. Every time we hook it up, it blows up. Because they were running this off of a CMOS driver instead of a, a switch that was either open or closed. It was not tri-state, it was either high or low. It was just blowing up the chip. So, it's RF isolated. You can look at the data sheet. In fact, you're going to have to read the data sheet in some detail to find out what size capacitors to use anyway. Right? You'll have to, you have to read up on this. Does it mean the chip in MPs? Oh, it's in the data sheet. It's in the lab. It's DCP. 05012 or something like that, but it's in the it's in the lab right up. And one thing you should look for, one thing that should immediately occur to you is, ah, what's the coupling capacitance between this side between the input and the output? What's the leakage capacitance? This is the capacitance you wish wasn't there, but is anyway. And let's say that under the worst possible circumstances, somehow or another, you manage to short plus 5 to the 110 volt power supply. The circuit goes kaboom and disappears, but the coils might still be there. You want to make sure that you can't get enough current across that loop to hurt you. So we have to figure out what the capacitance is and what that means in terms of worst case current. It turns out this coupling capacitance is between 3 and 4 picofarads. And you have to add just a little bit more for the effect of the whiteboard, but 3 or 4 picofarads. 
the current that can flow, which remember we said had to be less than 10 to the minus 5 amps, is given by V over Z. So worst case, this is 120 volts over 1 over J omega C, and which is 120 times J times omega is about 360 radians a second times 10 to the minus times 3 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. Right. <clears throat> so we can work this out, but it approximately 3 times 360 is about 1,000 times 100. It's kind of like 10 to the fifth or so. So this might be 3 or 4 times 10 to the fifth times 10 to the minus 12, or about 3 times 10 to the minus 7 amps. Yeah. So it's okay. We we need less than ten to the minus five amps, ten microamps. We're actually getting about a tenth, three tenths of a microamp leakage across this thing. Total worst case if you drop the hundred and ten line onto the power supply. So it's safe. It's a good isolator. Because you're gonna have to be building this circuit yourself with no detailed schematic, you need to figure out how you are going to modularly test the circuit as you build it. I suggest that the first thing you do is plug this into a whiteboard, connect five volts to it, put the appropriate capacitors on, put a little bit of load on it, maybe a 1k load or so and see what the voltages are and what you'll find is the voltages are not particularly well regulated they're kinda like 12 volts plus or minus a couple of volts does that matter for an op amp circuit because really what you're what you're what you're gonna be powering off of this is either a diff amp which is three op amps or a filter which is probably one or two op amps does it matter how what spec would you look at in the op amp data sheet to figure out whether it matters this requires a again a close reading of op amp data sheets but what you want to look at is the power supply rejection ratio how much does the output change if you change the out the power supply one volt? And at unity gain for an op amp, you would expect that the power supply rejection ratio should be huge. You should be able to you might get a one microvolt change in output for a one volt change in the power supply. It's very small change. So, in fact, it doesn't matter whether that's regulated, whether the power supply is regulated, as long as the capacitors are big enough to carry transients. Because if there's a very large sudden cur current surge, you could imagine that there's other artifacts that could come in. Do I see like 7805? Yeah, yeah, 7805s or 7905s are pretty good at transients up to a megahertz or so. And past that, you have to put capacitors on the output or they will not regulate transients. Because they're, they're a 7805 linear regulator is, in fact, an op-amp feedback device and, uh, require, and has a limited bandwidth. You can look at the spec sheet and you'll find that above a certain frequency it won't regulate. In fact, it'll oscillate without output capacitors. They sometimes oscillate at 100 megahertz. It's really hard to see that on the oscilloscope. The only thing that happens is everything gets hot. 
And can we put a Hall effect center, Hall effect sensor on the left side? Hall effect sensor. Because that would be, you would still have uh, the isolation, but you could measure, I mean, when you were looking up an iso uh, oscilloscope. So doing it through a Hall effect sensor, will that work? Oh. You're saying, what if you had a non-contact sensor? So Hall sensors are typically current sensors as opposed to voltage sensors. And so you have to have a fairly large current. You're not going to have that. You're going to have nanoamps here generally, so you probably won't be able to do that. So once you hook this to yourself, you can't hook an oscilloscope to this side anymore. All right, so we can get power onto this thing now. What about the other direction, the optocoupler. And there is a there's a lot of ways of doing this. You could convert you could convert this signal to a digital signal series of pulses, put pulses across a, an op, a standard opto-isolator, run the pulses over to here, decode the pulses again, say a pulse rate code or a pulse width code. Um, I decided to do this all analog. So the analog opto-coupler is going to look like this. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's an eight pin P-dip. Inside pin one and two is a photo emitting diode. Inside three and four is a photo receiving diode. Inside five and six is a photo receiving diode. So this pumps current to each of these diodes with coupling constants K1 and K2. That is to say, if we put one amp through this diode, in principle don't actually do that, put one amp through this diode, we get K1 amps out of this diode. So this has units of amp per amp. Right? It's just a, it's a unitless constant. If you were to just put current through this diode and or put a, a constant voltage across this diode, of course the output then is quite nonlinear, V versus I. And we'd have to do all kinds of calculations over here to figure out how to linearize it, but we can use the fact that there are two matched diodes here to provide feedback to linearize the coupler. So what do I mean by that? Well, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to drive, we're going to drive the, the LED which, by the way, will be connected. Let's see, this is the isolated side, so I really should say zero here and not ground. This is the isolated side. We're going to drive this with an op amp from some V in, and the negative lead of the op amp is going to go through some resistor to ground, but the other diode on this side is going to be connected to the resistor, R1. This point is going to go to V plus. On the grounded side, so this is the isolated side, this is the grounded side. On the grounded side, we're going to run this diode to V plus, run the other side into an op amp, a 
and call this V out. By the way, the coupling from this side, again, you always have to ask yourself, in the data sheet, it's an isolator, what's the spurious coupling that you wish wasn't there? And in the case of this device, it's about one picofarad, so it's quite small. So, oh, so let's a, let's analyze this and see how it how it works. Any questions on this before I erase it? This side. So if we call this point VA and this point VB then we know because there is feedback that VA has to equal VB always which is equal to VN V So VB then is, is VN, and let's call the current through here IP1, and the current through here I photo 2, IP2. Then IP1 is equal to VN over R1. But IP1 is also, by definition, equal to K1 times the forward current through the diode. So we'll call this I forward here. Or Vn is equal to K1 times IF times R1. Right? Just rearranging this. Eliminating IP1 and rearranging. You get that Vn is K1 times the forward current times R1. But also now, this is a follower. So V out must be equal to IP2 times R2, which I did not label here, R2. So V out then is equal to K2 IF times R2. Just substituting K2 times IF for IP2. Or V out over V in. is equal to K2 R2 over K1 R1. Huh, those are all constants. So it's linear. So there's a gain from one side to the other. By the way, K, K1 and K2 are something like 0 0.1 to, to, to 2 or so, someplace in that range. But they're approximately equal. So they approximately cancel here. Maybe not exactly. You don't care. It's still a constant.
So you can calibrate, so you can build, you can build this little section, just this, build this little section, put a known height pulse in here, and calibrate how much current, how much voltage comes out here, and then you'll know everything you need to know about the gain of this circuit. And you can change R1 and R2 until you get some handy gain like 1. But you don't have to, you just, but you can cal calibrate. Once you calibrate it, you know the gain. But since you don't know K1 and K2 exactly for the given in in integrated circuit you have, you'll have to calibrate it. Anything strike you about that circuit? Anything? What happened? Oh, well, yes? It's cool. It's very interesting. And it's, it's, it falls out mathematically very cleanly, which is appealing. However, building it is a little tricky. Yes? Why do we need the K1 linkage to be optical? You want these to be responding to the same light output so that because you're using this diode to cancel the nonlinearity of this diode pair. And so you hope that all of the nonlinearities are the same. And as long as all the diodes are on the same chip and all the same temperature, they'll be very close to the same. Yes, yes, in fact, that's a good point. If you look at the data sheet very carefully, and this one you really need to read very carefully. This is, by the, this is a, a uh, IL300. It's a Vichy IL300. You have to read it very carefully, and what you'll find is there is some instability which can happen unless you bandwidth limit the system. And what they recommend is a capacitor across there to bandwidth limit it. Thank you. That's one thing to look out for. This sucker oscillates easily. All right, that's one reason you want to test it in isolation before you hook anything else up. There's another more subtle thing here. V in cannot go negative. Because you can't pull current backwards through that diode. So you have to bias the system above ground so that you get symmetrical current. You get symmetrical signals. So V in, v in must be strictly greater than zero. At all times. Turns out there is also, according to the data sheet, a kind of best linearity region. And the best linearity occurs when IF is greater than about 0.5, 0 0.5 milliamps, greater than or equal, greater than, less than or equal to about 20 milliamps. So you're going to want to tune this resistor RF to be to get the current into this range for the voltage input that you're going to be using. So let's say that V plus, V plus is equal to 12 volts and V minus is minus 12 volts or so. Let's say we bias this point under normal circumstances to plus 6 volts. All right. We bias this to plus 6 volts or so, maybe plus 3 volts. That's going to produce a standing current through here. You might adjust that standing current to be 10 milliamps. So if this were 3 volts and we want 10 milliamps, then we need... Um, hmm, um, hmm, uh, uh, what, uh, 100 ohms there or something? 300 ohms? Something like that. And since the optical 
two diodes between one and two is probably an LED. Aren't there voltage and current limitations to it? Well, there are also. Right, yes, there are. This cannot possibly become more, uh, well, yes, there are, there are certainly current limitations, and you'll find that this thing clips everywhere. It becomes nonlinear at all kinds of different locations in, in the voltage input. So one of the design aspects of this is you're going to have to find a good VN to run the system at, a good RF to run it at, and an appropriate gain on R1 and R2. So probably what you're going to put in here is after your diff amp, after your, your input diff amp, you're probably then going to run a subtractor to subtract or to add a, 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 an offset voltage to the input. So um, some, some system where you add you add a voltage in, maybe a minus voltage here to so I'm, I'm just drawing a, a symmetric subtractor which will then become VN so you want to add some negative voltage to bring the the input up uh, above zero on average here you have to mess with this get it to run. Um, I was also talking about the output from the op amp. What this op amp? Yes. So is there a voltage threshold that can go through pin 2? A voltage? Do you mean a turn on voltage? Or At the upper limit? I mean. Well, there's an upper limit to the current where you blow out the LED. Yeah, but and obviously you can't go above um, plus 12 which is going to be the power supply. So you, you probably want to adjust the feedback resistor so that if this, if this op amp goes to the rail, you don't blow up the LED. But the LED is pretty tough. I think it'll take at least 50 mils. Well, I can tell you what it'll take. Hold on a minute here. I keep this with me at all times. Because it is, it is a, it's a good one. It's a absolute maximum forward current IF 60 mils. <coughs> Surge current 250 mils. If you pulse this thing, capable of 60 mils, you'll be all right. Reverse voltage of five volts. Uh oh. If you drive this thing to the negative rail, you'll blow up the LED. So, if you want to be extra safe, you put a diode in series with that. Or, you don't hook this to minus 12, you hook it to zero. That's even a better idea. So the way you read these data sheets is you print them. I know, primitive paper-based technology. You print them, and then you go through them with your yellow underliner, and you highlight everything that could kill you or blow up the circuit. And then you read it again. And I would say I've probably read this data sheet probably 10 times, and I keep finding stuff in it. You really want to go through this line by line. It'll be worth your time. So you have to play with this. I don't I don't know for sure what values R and RF, R1, RF, and R2 are going to work. That's what you're going to figure out in the lab. That's why this is a two-week lab. You're going to have to play with the power supply to make it stable. You're going to have to 
mess with driving op amps from the power supply. There's a lot of design aspect to this that you're just going to have to play with. But that's what makes it fun. This is not a canned lab. In the end, after everything is debugged, you should be able to take an electrode. I have patch electrodes that look like this. The actual size is maybe two inches. They have three electrodes on them, which would be plus, minus, and neutral. Not ground, but zero volts on the isolated side. You'd hook to these with three clip leads and then take the clip leads back to your, app, to your circuit. And when you flex, you should see a voltage change. You probably want to arrange this so that one of the electrodes is more over the body of the muscle and the, and, the, and the neutral or the negative side is off to the side of the muscle a little bit. So try not to make it symmetric along the length of the muscle, make it symmetric across the side of the muscle. Or go to a slightly smaller muscle like your forearm muscles where you can, you can flex, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, most of your hand muscles are up here, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a thumb muscle here which does this, and there's this muscle over here which does this, but they're little and they're weak, right? They, you can't really put out much force with your little finger. The main muscles that grip are up in here, and there's a middle finger muscle right there that you can get on with the EMG electrodes. Your index finger muscle is a little deeper, but it's right in there. And so you can find some smaller muscles down here if you want to use if you want to look for different electrode positions. But I'd say for the most part, start out by trying to slap this on your bicep. That's usually a pretty strong, big muscle. You have to talk about why this works. Say again? You have to talk about why silver chloride. Oh yes, we're gonna we're gonna talk about electrodes. Yes. That's the next topic is electro design but before we do that I want to uh, because we still have at least one more lecture before the before this lab starts yes I want to talk about uh, possible lab fours and as I said earlier when you have a new hammer everything looks like a nail so I'm going to use my iPad my new iPad to show you some possibilities, assuming I can get this all running again. This, that's, yeah, that's good. That's not good yet. Ah, there it is. If I remember right, this screen requires that you hook it over the nail down here, otherwise it snaps back up and breaks your hand. All right, so one possibility, the default possibility that I did four years ago is to build a more involved version of the circuit that we're building for lab three in the sense that this piece is exactly the same and in fact you wouldn't change it, but you would add a voltage controlled current source, another analog opto coming from the D to A signal on the NIDAC, the digital analog, feed that back through, put a small controlled current, a few microamp current into your arm, sine wave typically, and measure the impedance. Measure the phase shift and the amplitude of the voltage that comes out and get your skin impedance. And of course there would have to be power supply as before, but really what you're doing is adding a closed loop system where you're, you're putting a current on, you're measuring a voltage coming back out. I was not entirely happy with this lab. I thought it was awfully hard to get a decent result out and I'm not sure why. But it did work, but it was, it was tough going. Another possibility is to go to a one of the labs I did for the ECE 1810 course, but of course beef it up a little bit because you know more than freshmen do. So in the in the 1810 course, 
we had them build a model of the heart, a transistor model of the heart, where where this represented a sinal atrial node cell, a pacemaker cell. You have your membrane capacitance, your membrane resting resistance, two transistors which represent a sodium channel, and a transistor that represents a potassium channel. So this is kind of a bulk model at the, of, a, of a cell at the at the IV level. It, 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 mo it simulates the IV, the current voltage relationships of a ohmic channel and two non-ohmic channels, the voltage variable channels. This thing oscillates. It produces a waveform which is kind of like this. This is simulation. It produces a nice oscillating action potential. It's an autonomous oscillator. Then this is coupled through a rectifying electrical junction. This would be like the sinoatrial node plus the, what is it, the bundle of Hiss or something. And then it goes down to a ventricular cell model, which has a passive current, a sodium current, a sodium leak, a potassium current, and a mixed current which would be more or less like a calcium current or a, a nonspecific <coughs> cation current which produces a waveform that looks like this. So you have the fast spike corresponding to sodium conductance followed by a long plateau. And I had the, the freshman build this but not do too much analysis of it. What I would have you do is, a, is an analysis of where the system oscillates, where it doesn't oscillate, coupling, coupling strengths, what makes sense to vary, uh, can you get these to synchronize? Build three of them, make them synchronize. So it would be more about synchronization of oscillators than than merely building the circuit. The other thing we did then in, 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 the, in the freshman course was then to build a pacemaker, kill the, kill the SA cell so that it no longer oscillated, build a pacemaker and bring the whole system back to life, which is, was good, it was good fun. So in this case then we have the pulse generator followed by a highly modified action potential coming out of the SA node followed by the uh, ventricle sometime later. So this was, can't drag on that, geez. Mixing my metaphors up here. Uh, I, I've become addicted to this thing in about 36 hours. I mean, it's, it's better than heroin. For, for addictive for addictive capability at least so um, so you've got so there, there's some interesting things you could do here with what is the what is the entrainment what is the shape of the current versus entrainment capability you you, you run the pace you run the pacemaker at different frequencies and in some frequency ranges you can entrain the heart and cause it to beat and in other frequency ranges you won't entrain the heart if you change if you turn up the current you can entrain over a larger range of frequencies getting those curves might be interesting because it says something about nonlinear oscillators in general another possibility which i did for um, uh... a this is actually for high school students. <clears throat> yeah, Curie says, was to build a, a model, an electrical model of a gene oscillator. Now, this is not exactly bioinstrumentation, but it's related. Uh, you have three proteins that oscillate in order 
inside the cell that produce a nonlinear oscillator. You think of them as a pacemaker, uh, as, a, as a circadian rhythm, as a rhythm generator. And what I had the students do was to build a model of that which would, um, yeah, this was very clever. See, that's the, this is one link, but that's a separate link. This is security through obscurity. So that, so hopefully I got that link right there. Yes. So this was what I wanted them to build, but I didn't want them to see it, although I linked it up on the same page. Exactly none of the students found the hidden link, which was on the page. Uh, I'm showing it because I figured, you know, you'll go look at the source code of my page anyway. <laughs> but what, I, what I'm doing here is to model, to, to use some very low uh, precision models of, of a promoter which builds up in concentration, that's what an RC filter is, is a buildup of a promoter, which causes translation of a, pro of a DRNA to a protein, which then builds up in concentration, which inhibits the next promoter, which inhibits the next promoter, and that's fed back. And this thing oscillates. And you can entrain the oscillators. You can cause in real in real systems some of this protein leaks out, or, or the, one of the side effects is that a, a material leads out leaks out of the cells, and you can get whole colonies of bacteria that have been genetically modified to produce this cycle blinking in unison. That's cool. So, question is, over what range of oscillations and under what conditions can you get phase locking between the different cells? This is equivalent to the firefly phase locking problem. You know that there's some fireflies that phase lock so the whole tree blinks at the same time. And have you seen this? Google, go, YouTube it up. Maybe I can, uh, you know, who knows what you get on YouTube if I just blind go YouTube you know, for firefly. I'm not going to do that. Um, but, uh, but you can, uh, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, there are some species of fireflies that, that phase lock. And they phase lock by watching each other blink. And by watching each other blink and by making assumptions about the period, they all phase lock to, so they all blink exactly simultaneously and it's stable. And this is, a, this is your basic long distance communicator, right? One guy can be seen for, a, for 50 meters, but a whole tree can be seen a mile away. So um, there's some interest in how these things synchronize and under what conditions. You could imagine building a better model of the, of the protein than I did, a better model of the promoter. Um, it's, again, it's not exactly. Um, <clears throat> Bioinstrumentation, but it's related. Just yeah. curiosity, are there places where different trees blink to each other or blink in unison? Good question. I don't know the answer. I suspect that several trees can synchronize if they're close enough. So it has something to do with distance and intensity. Um, what do you think? This is a small enough group. You know, we can it can hack on the course. It doesn't. I mean, do you want to do you want to want to build a, a an IV curve generator for your arm? Do you want to mess around with nonlinear oscillators? Do you want to do something else? If it's something if it's something else, what do you want to do? What do you what would you just crave to build? Don't have to answer me today. This is just to kind of warm you up to the idea. You mentioned once that once you have both device where you show like a different like yeah, some more work needs to be done on that to make sure it was completely real. But the idea is to shine light in through a non-focusing piece of your eye, through the sclera. 
and see if you can get a beam of infrared coming out of your pupil and then track the infrared beam. And I'm pretty sure you could do it, but it needs to be quantified. And I think it would be just cool as could be to have a bunch of infrared sensing diodes on a piece of paper. And you look at one, and the, diode, and the visible diode next to it turns on. So you have gaze-controlled uh, game controller, right? It's just that easy. I think that, I, if it works, I mean, there's some, some development that has to be done. That could be a final project. That doesn't have to be Lab 4. So what do you think? What do you want? Yeah, turn yourself off. Good. So what do you, what do you think? What are you, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? Any, any? more ideas? Well, there's, there's certainly, uh, are there some other universities that have similar labs where we could look up and probably find some? Sure. Yeah. The the my constraints are that it has to be be able to be done for on the order of thirty dollars per group, maybe fifty dollars per group, and it has to be, of course, safe. It has to have a reasonable probability of working, and it has to be teachable. So, are you aware of any such courses? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, generally, if I if I had other ideas, I'd you know come up with them on the spot. The I'm a, I'm a little bit loath to just flop something out on the table that I haven't actually like tried. Okay. All right, that's the that's the the constraint. Um, let's see. Well, you're not going to simulate this hard thing. You're going to build it. This is transistors on the board, right? So, yes, the simulation you, 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 I did for the freshmen because you got to, you got to, I mean, because they didn't have the analytical tools to solve the circuit. But, but in fact, what you're going to do is you're going to build it. It's not going to be simulation. All right, so you're going to build the oscillator, characterize it, hack on it, Synchronize them. Try and build a heart. Maybe everybody in the in the in the room builds one cell or two cells, and then you hook them all together, and you make it beat. Chris? Yes. If you put all those cells together, can you produce the fibrillation? Well, yes. The interesting question: Can you can you produce a, a desynchronized state? And uh, I don't know how big a loop you have to have before you can do that, because a, a desynchronized state like a fibrillation is some sort of traveling wave that goes around the heart. And so the system has to be big enough that a cell has recovered and is excitable again by the time the wave comes around again. Maybe we introduce a delay. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe mess with the parameters to make it more sensitive. Uh, oh, that'd be, that'd be fun to see if you could build enough cells to make the system fibrillate under certain circumstances. Yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. I, I, again, I haven't tried it, so I don't know that I can do that. Active cell model. What did I do for an active cell model there? Oh yes, this was this was the, this is the biology version. I taught the, I taught an instrumentation course. I had the humans chain pretend they were the sodium potassium channel. So you have two pots. I'm 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 sodium and potassium, right? And you get an IV curve. So you get an IV curve that looks like an action potential if you're good. I actually couldn't do that, but this graduate student who we called Doobie could, uh, Dustin, was pretty good at it. So, um, if you wanted to build a circuit that simulated a Hodgkin Huxley model, I mean, build the circuit. The Hodgkin Huxley model is a mathematical description of an action potential, but you want to build a circuit, circuit that actually executes the differential equations. Um, and the transistor circuits approximately do that. You can make them more or less accurate depending on how many transistors you use. The minimum is about three. 
What appeals here? You want to think about it for a while? Think about it a little bit. The default will be build some more instrumentation circuitry to, to use on your, on your own arm. There's gamma. There's uh, you mean there's oscillations in your brain, right? There's, and and so you could. Uh, you could look at alpha rhythms or or other rhythms in your brain. I'm I'm not going to let you hook, uh, uh, with a lab full of people who are all doing different things. I, I just am not comfortable with having you record from your head. So, I want everybody to do the same thing, at least approximately. So you have to decide among yourselves what you're going to do, or we have to come to some sort of consensus. And, and I'm reasonably flexible, but I want, to, I want to have some basis for grading so that everybody is doing approximately the same thing. So I'd say you have till next time, to the so next lecture, to figure out what you want to do. So there's some... There's some Ma, there are build some build some cell models that are are approximately correct at the at the current voltage level. Do some instrumentation, uh, gene model. Um, there's some other possible timing things we could do in terms of nonlinear oscillators. But those are the three I've come up with so far of stuff I know actually like works in the lab. Well, let's talk a little bit about bioelectrodes then. We have, oh, 10 minutes or so. Excuse me while I... Uh, deal with this cold. So the question is how to connect biology to electronics and the, the problem is that let's sort of symbolically or, or schematically take some sort of metal wire here and drop it into the, into the biology and we're going to abstract that as a sodium potassium chloride solution which could describe your blood or sweat or any sort of reasonable biological fluid and the mobile entity in the wire is of course electrons which represents a current going this way formal current out electron in formal current out and the problem is <clears throat> that electrons are quite mobile and soluble in metal, but they're not significantly mobile or soluble in water. And sodium, potassium, and chloride are not particularly soluble in most metals. So you have this problem. If this is stainless steel, and stainless steel is used as a recording wire under certain circumstances, let's say that you want to you want to put a wire into the brain of a rat that's going to last a while. You might use uh, um, oh, HS21, which is a formulation of stainless steel. And what's going to happen is then when you pass current down through this wire, let's say you pass an electron down this wire, one electron, what's going to happen is the electron is going to go to the edge of the metal and sit here and it's going to attract for instance a potassium ion to bounce right up against the edge of the metal and sit there can't get in but it's going to sit there and that is equivalent then to one positive ion being pulled out of solution and so current is flowing this way and you could pile up some more electrons here and get some more sodium stuck to it and um, sooner or later, 
you will have covered the surface with sodium ions and no more current will flow because do you know another name for this? It's an electrolytic capacitor. So really what you're saying is you're building a capacitive coupling between the current inside and the ions outside. So if you expect to be able to use this electrode for any length of time, you have to make sure that the current, the average current into the electrode is exactly zero. That way charges neither build up nor are depleted. On the long term, the current has to be exactly zero. Oh. Mm. Well, how do you enforce that? You capacitor couple it. <clears throat> so, no matter how you're going to use this electrode, you have to make sure that there is no long-term current flow and therefore it is impossible to get any sort of DC changes. It is impossible to record DC from it. And what's worse is because you are charging this electrode up, as you push current into it, its voltage changes. It's a capacitor. And what you'd really like is a electrode that has a voltage which is independent of the current so that you can make easier measurements, better measurements, and not be, and not be limited by this. By the way, the, the, the equivalent circuit for this is something like a battery with some sort of displacement capacitance, but there's also a leakage across the capacitor because there's some other impurities in there or you're getting some sort of current flow. And then a series resistance. So the electrode is, has some sort of offset potential, a large capacitance, a large resistance, and a fairly small resistance here. So, yeah, oh yeah, and if you, yeah, well, I, won't, I won't show you the Bode plot of that right now. So what do you want? What do you want out of a, an electrode? You want Well, you got to be able to have to be able to pass DC. That would be nice. So it should be an ohmic connection. Whatever this thing is, it's going to be, have to be some sort of chemical reaction because because you're going to have to somehow pull chloride or sodium out of solution. You're going to have to do some sort of chemical reaction. So you need a non-toxic reaction. There has to be an insoluble reaction product. Otherwise, as soon as you react on the surface, it's going to fall off into solution and, you, and you've lost any advantage that you have. Now, what this means is, and one of the past DC implies that the, the solid and the solution share an ion, at least in principle. And also, the solid has got to be a conductor. There's only a couple of things. No, actually, I only know of one thing that, that meets all these criteria, and that's silver silver chloride electrodes. So if you draw one of these things, what you're going to have is a chunk of silver coated 
with perhaps an uneven coat of silver chloride and maybe some metal exposed, maybe not, maybe a little bit of metal exposed. And we have a couple of reversible reactions. One is that silver reversibly goes to silver plus plus an electron. Mass balance works, charge balance works. And that silver and plus and chloride minus can reversibly react to produce silver chloride. This is a solid. It is also a conductor. And it's really insoluble. It has a solubility product, I looked this up, of about 10 to the minus 10 moles. So it is a solid, insoluble conductor. How handy. So what this amounts to is Oh, they're backed with the impact wrenches again, but at least it's a little further away today. So let's say an electron flows into the silver. That means that a silver plus chloride minus falls apart and leaves reduced silver and a f chloride floats off into solution. floats off into solution. Let's say an E flows out of the silver. Then there's some silver that there's some silver that becomes silver chloride, which pulls a chloride, chloride minus, out of solution. Silver is not particularly toxic. Silver metal is not particularly toxic. It's not soluble. And silver chloride is, again, not soluble. So you have this interesting system where you can pass a chloride ion from the solid phase as silver chloride into the liquid phase as chloride minus. And that carries electrons in and out effectively. It carries charge in and out of the metal into solution. It's a reversible reaction. It's fast. It's easy to set up. And you can buy electrodes that are pre-made. We'll talk more about that next time. So the basic chemistry is that you're going you're gonna to build a, an electrode, which is some mix of silver and silver chloride. And in commercial systems, it's a sintered powder. You mix silver chloride together with, with silver and you press it in a press under heat. It's called sintering. You, you make a solid out of it, but it has a high surface area because it's little particles that are pushed together. High surface area means good conductivity. You have both silver and silver chloride in contact with the solution, which means that you can under, undergo this reversible reaction very easily. And nobody in their right mind does this by hand, although I used to, you know, 40 years ago when I was doing electrophysiology, you couldn't buy silver, silver chloride pellets, so we made our own. Nobody does that anymore. Um, we'll talk about the details next time. Think about, think about what you want to do for lab four. What is most interesting to you? We'll have a vote. <laughs>